Welcome to Life Study of the Bible, brought to you by Living Stream Ministry. These programs are based on the ministry of Witness Lee and his 21-year crowning work, The Life Study of the Bible, which focuses on the enjoyment of Christ as the divine life as revealed in the Bible. We hope that through these studies you'll be brought into a deeper enjoyment of the Scriptures and of our dear and precious Lord Jesus. You can contact us by sending email to radio at lsm.org or reach us toll-free, 888-LIFE-STUDY. Now, let's join today's program. Of all the signs and pictures given to us in the book of Revelation, the one that is most crucial for us to give our attention to is the one presented in the very first verse of this book, Revelation 1.1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his slaves the things that must quickly take place, and he made it known by signs, sending it by his angel to his slave, John. Ron Kangas has joined us once again for our second introductory program on this life study of Revelation. Brother Ron, we had a tremendous beginning, I thought, yesterday, as we really had a very good overview of Revelation. And I think we have an equally nourishing portion today as we really focus in on this phrase, the revelation of Jesus Christ. This phrase is worthy of our utmost attention. It's not too much to say that the correct understanding of the book of Revelation depends upon the correct understanding of these words, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Well, since you brought it up, let's spend a minute to talk about that as an introduction to our program. I want to point out as we get started here today that unfortunately we were not able to uh, use the tape recording that we had of Witness Lee sharing this message. There was a technical problem that we couldn't overcome, and we regret that. We'll do our best to try to cover it faithfully. But particularly as he spoke it, he was very burdened about this phrase, this one we're talking about, the revelation of Jesus Christ. In its context there in verse 1, there are a couple of ways that it can be understood. Uh, What is our view, and why do we take this view? The first view, and uh, from our knowledge, it's the more common view, although a less accurate one. This view is that the phrase, the revelation of Jesus Christ, refers to a revelation that is altogether objective and to a revelation that belongs to Christ and especially has been given to us by Christ. In other words, uh, Christ is in possession of a revelation, which of course is true, and that this book is then the presenting of this revelation to us. We regard this as inaccurate in the sense that it misses the main point and that it causes the contents of the book of Revelation to remain objective to us. Just something outside of us, here is a revelation that Christ is showing us. The second view is that the phrase, the revelation of Jesus Christ, means that this book is a revelation of the person of Christ in a particular way. And that way is in many aspects unique, and it surely is consummate. So in the first understanding, we have a revelation of matters provided to us by Christ. In the second, we have a revelation that is an unveiling of Christ himself. This makes Christ so real, so personal, even subjective and experiential to us. Our understanding of this phrase is borne out by the book of Revelation itself, which goes on again and again to unveil Christ the person in previously unprecedented ways. So what our fellowship on this point boils down to is this. The center of the book of Revelation is not prophetic information. The center of the book of Revelation is Jesus Christ himself, the person. That is why the first matter unveiled in chapter 1 is the person of Christ. So the subject of Revelation is Christ as the center of God's administration according to God's economy. So the subject of Revelation is Christ because the book of Revelation is an unveiling of Christ. 
God's center is Christ. God's focus is Christ. God's emphasis is Christ. If we read the book of Revelation with another center or focus or emphasis, we will, at least in part, have an erroneous understanding. Why? Because we miss the main point, and the main point is a person, Jesus Christ. Chris, this book is the unveiling of Jesus Christ in the divine administration for the carrying out of God's economy. Everything in this book must be viewed, understood, applied, and experienced in relation to this wonderful person, the all-inclusive Christ of God. We have selected a few passages, a few portions uh, throughout the book that really bring up various aspects. There are many more, but we have uh, at least selected a few, and we'll see how many we're able to get through in the time allotted to us today. first one we want to look at is a view of Christ that is very striking fairly early on in the book, uh, in chapter 5. Let me read a couple of verses here, Ron, and then just ask you to comment about the Christ in these verses, the lion-lamb Christ. And no one in heaven nor on earth nor under the earth was able to open the scroll or look into it. And I wept much because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so that he may open the scroll and its seven seals. And I saw in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders a lamb standing as having been slain, having seven horns, and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. Quite a Christ portrayed in these verses, Ron. Indeed, quite a Christ. So, in consideration of our focus, our concern is not first with uh, the living creatures or with the identity of the 24 elders, but with this marvelous person on the throne. And we call him the Lion Lamb with a hyphen, because we're told that the lion of the tribe of Judah is worthy to open the scroll. So that surely refers to Christ. But the one on the throne unveiled to John was the lamb. So this lamb is called a lion. Therefore, we regard him with reverence as the lion lamb. And because lion is mentioned before lamb here, we put the compound title in this way. This is a unique and particular revelation of Christ, is it not? So this should occupy our attention very much. So in what sense is Christ a lion? And in what sense is he a lamb? Well, there's an enemy. And according to types and prophecies particularly at the end of Genesis, it may be in chapter 49, if I remember correctly, Christ is prophesied as a lion, as the lion, as the kingly, roaring lion. Christ in his death has conquered the enemy and destroyed the enemy's kingdom. So toward the enemy, the devil, Satan, Christ truly is a lion. How I rejoice there is a lion, so to speak, in charge of the universe, quite able, through our prayers, to deal with his enemy. So toward Satan, Christ is a lion, but toward us, his chosen and redeemed people, he is surely the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world. So he is on the throne as a lamb, Again and again, he is identified as the Lamb. In chapter 22, verse 1, the throne is the throne of God and of the Lamb. This means that on the throne, God is the redeeming God. Toward us, Christ is the Lamb who died for our sins, that we might be redeemed to God and regenerated by him to be the constituents of the new Jerusalem, ultimately. Toward the enemy, Christ is the lion who died to destroy the works of the devil. And now this wonderful person, the only one worthy to open the seals 
of the scroll of God's economy, this wonderful person is administrating the entire universe and everything and everyone in it and everything that is taking place. Talk about a proper focus. This is God's focus before all the other details are revealed from chapter 6 through chapter 20. What is at the center? Again, frogs? No. Locusts? Of course not. But a wonderful person, the lion lamb on the throne, the object of universal worship and praise. If we see him in spirit through this word, and if we appreciate him, will we not join the hosts in the heavens, worshiping, adoring, praising, extolling, lauding this marvelous lion lamb administrator on the throne carrying out the divine economy. Surely we will. And regarding this segment of our broadcast, this is our burden. Well, against that backdrop, it's uh, we'll have to have the Lord's covering here to touch this next subject because this is the one on the list that uh, we had prepared today that maybe comes closer to... Uh, enticing us and our curiosities and our interests. But nonetheless, we would not lose focus even as we touch this matter. And the next one on the table today is Christ as we see him in his coming back. Now, particularly interesting in this book, on this topic, I've selected four verses here. I want to read them in two groups, two groups of two, uh, because they show two different aspects of the Lord's coming. And as has been interpreted over the centuries even, There is an appearance here, apparently, and I think we'll see as we read the verses that there may be some contradiction here. Of course, we know that this is God's word, and therefore there is no contradiction. But let's look at it and then ask you to comment, Ron. Uh, In Revelation 3, verse 3, it says, If therefore you will not watch, I will come as a thief, and you shall by no means know at what hour I will come upon you. Similar phrase appears again in chapter 16, verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments. This is the first group, showing his coming, something in secret as a thief. Now, in chapter 1, verse 7, it says, Behold, he comes with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the land will mourn over him. Yes, amen. Uh, Verse 14, in chapter 14, again picks up this thought. And I saw, and behold, there was a white cloud, And on the cloud, one like the Son of Man sitting, having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. So, Ron, we have verses that show us a secret coming as a thief, one that we need to watch for. And then other verses that show us an open coming on the clouds for every eye to see. How do we reconcile this? Notice the emphasis in the verses, still on the person. I will come, 3-3. I come, 16-15. He comes with clouds, uh, 1 7. One like the Son of Man, 14 14. So, in studying the coming of Christ, we need to emphasize the coming of Christ. Now, his coming has two aspects, separated by a period of about three and a half years. On the one hand, he will come secretly to rapture to himself not all the believers at the same time otherwise the word in 3.3 doesn't have any real meaning but he will come secretly to take those that are mature those that are the overcoming ones those who are ready and those who are watchful he will come and take them to himself And they will, according to chapter 14, be with him on Mount Zion in the heavens. More about the next point in further messages. But after that rapture of the first fruits of the overcomers, of the man-child, the Lord will begin the process of his parousia, descending from the heavens to the air, hidden in a cloud. And then at the very end of the Great Tribulation, this one who has been coming secretly will now come manifestly 
openly. So that will be the time when every eye will see him. That will be the time when it will be open, it will be visible, it will be manifest. Crucial to our understanding of this is the realization that Christ's coming is in fact a process over a period of about three and a half years. It begins with the secret aspect of his taking the ready ones to himself. It consummates with the open aspect when he now manifests himself openly, publicly to those on the earth. Well, Ron, another unmistakable thread that runs throughout this book as we look to see the revelation of Christ is the matter of judgment. Now, there were so many verses here. Really, I, I didn't select any, and I just give you the freedom to touch any that you uh, have the feeling to. But in this book, particularly from chapter 6 through chapter 20, we see Christ judging so many things related to the earth, to Antichrist, to Babylon, and eventually even all of the dead. But there's a result or an effect of this judgment that I would really like to focus on today. And I think you know where I'm going. I think I do. Let's point out at the outset that this is a book, Revelation, uh, is a book of administration. And God's administration during the present dispensation is largely carried out by his judgment. So we know from John chapter 5 that judgment is given to Christ as the Son of Man. Now, there is so much on the earth that is contrary to and opposes God's economy. All that must be judged. There is so much on the earth, under the control of the enemy, which resists, now we're getting to the point, the kingdom of God coming to the earth, the will of God being done on earth, the Son of Man returning to earth. There is so much that resists all this, that must be judged. There will be a thorough and severe judgment. But this is all a preparation for Christ to come and take possession of the earth. We know from Matthew 13 that in order to gain the kingdom as the treasure, he purchased the earth. The earth was not only created by God, it was redeemed by Christ. It belongs to him. Believers may, in their dreams, so to speak, be interested in heaven, but God is focused on the earth. He wants the kingdom to come to the earth and the earth will be judged as a preparation for the Lord to come to this earth, to set up his throne on this earth, to have a thousand-year kingdom on this earth, and eventually to have a new earth with a new heaven for the new creation, the new Jerusalem. So let's focus on these two words, judging and taking possession. Christ's judgment is a prelude for his coming to take possession of the earth. Even this applies to us experientially. The more the Lord judges us in our fallen part, the more he takes possession of us positively for his economy. The principle is the same now objectively. He will judge the earth in righteousness. Then he will possess the earth for God's kingdom and for God's economy. This is a strong theme in the book of Revelation. Well, and it leads uh, very well, and we have saved just a couple of minutes for a vast topic, so we'll just touch it today for this last view of Christ that we want to see in this book, and it's one that is mysterious yet altogether marvelous. And uh, we have just a few verses here that show us what Witness Lee described in his ministry, and I believe Watchman Nee also used this term. You can correct me if I'm wrong there. But the centrality and universality of Christ in chapter 21, And one of the seven angels came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in spirit onto a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon that they should shine in it, for the glory of God illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb." And he showed me a river of water of life, bright as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb in the middle of its street. And on this side and on that side of the river was the tree of life, producing twelve fruits, yielding its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree 
are for the healing of the nations. This is the consummation of Revelation, the consummation of the Bible, the consummation of God's eternal economy. The New Jerusalem is not heaven. The New Jerusalem is not a material city with literal gold and pearl, etc. The New Jerusalem, as the consummation of the body of Christ, is the organism of the triune God in his economy, united and mingled and incorporated with his chosen, redeemed, regenerated, transformed and glorified people to be one organic entity, that entity from the standpoint of the divine romance, a tremendous theme in the scriptures, is a universal couple. God is the husband and we are the wife. On the other hand, the New Jerusalem is the ultimate and consummate form of the kingdom of God. The crucial point here is that in this marvelous organic entity, Christ is the centrality. That means he's the center. He's the hub. And he is also the universality. That means he is everything. He is the totality. So he is the lamp in which God the light is. This light then shines out through the lamp to reach every part of the city. The crucial point here is that in chapter 1, we have Christ in the midst of of the churches symbolized by the golden lampstands. The New Jerusalem as the consummate golden lampstand uh, ends the book. And in the center of the New Jerusalem, as the centrality and universality, we still have this wonderful Christ, the Lamb and the Lamp. And out from the throne of God and the Lamb flows the river. That's the spirit of life. And in the river is the tree, that's Christ as the tree of life. The Bible ends, the book of Revelation ends, not with frogs, not with beasts, but with a marvelous consummation of God's organic salvation and of his divine economy, the new Jerusalem, the triune God and his economy and his redeemed people as one entity. And the center of this is the person, Jesus Christ. Chris, no wonder when God inspired John to write this book, the words were uttered in the beginning, the revelation of Jesus Christ. From chapter 1 through chapter 22, there is a focus, there is a center. That is Jesus Christ revealed uniquely and consummately in and for God's universal governmental administration. In a sense, in Christ, we would plead with our listeners to take God's focus and center as their focus and center. This is the way to have the divine view and the divine understanding of the book of Revelation. And this will be the key to all the following messages in this marvelous and blessed life study of Revelation. Ron, I can tell there's a deep abiding burden in you in some regard. Uh, you're very much one uh, in spirit with the lion lamb today on this point. All that is due to the mercy and grace of God. It is our privilege in his redemption to be one with him. And also, and we say this with due respect, to be one with the burden of this ministry. Ron, we're out of time. Uh, it seems the Lord was with us. We covered a lot of ground today. All of these points will be developed as we really dive into this life study. So we hope our listeners are on uh, board for the long term as we go forward. Please come back when you can. I gladly do so. As we leave, let me just point out our toll-free number and invite you to contact us. It's 1-888-LIFE-STUDY. That's 888-543-3788. Please. Do give us a call today. We'll return tomorrow with another life study from the life study of Revelation. For Ron Kangas today, I'm Chris Wilde. Thank you for listening.
You've been listening to Life Study of the Bible with Witness Lee, produced by Living Stream Ministry. Witness Lee ministered the Word of God for over seven decades. Many consider these life studies as his seminal work, an exhaustive commentary on the entire Bible from the perspective of the believer's enjoyment and experience of God's divine life in Christ through the Spirit. If you'd like to find more about Witness Lee, these life study messages, or any of the materials provided by Living Stream Ministry, please visit our website, lsm.org. That's lsm.org. You can also email us, radio at lsm.org, or call us toll-free, 1-888-LIFE-STUDY. Thanks for listening today.